Thanks. Take her down to periscope depth. Yes, sir. Clear the bridge. Dive. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. Today is going to be a, another episode of Nerds Go Clubbing. Today's topic will be cortical and structural inheritance, forms of inheritance that uh, uh, transcend DNA inheritance. So I'm privileged to have uh, as my co-host, Emery, and Emery has been a uh, a faithful and loyal friend, even through thick and thin. Uh, last week, he was uh, struggling through illness, and he still served as my co-host in a, an after show, and I'm very pleased to report he's he's well now. And uh, Emery, for those, uh, many people in the audience already know who you are, but if you could do a quick introduction. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, as uh, Sal said, my name is Emery Moyna. Well, at least that's my YouTube name. Um, once I get out of grad school, I might use my real one. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I run the uh, blog In His Image. Um, it has a YouTube channel, social media, although we may or may not end up getting booted off social media with all the stuff going on. So um, we're on all the alternative social medias now as well. We've oh, em up Emery, on. you uh, died off there. Sorry. Oh, no. Okay. I'm still here. Uh, you, uh, your you your audio was got weak very quickly. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, I'm not sure why it's doing that, but uh, <laughs> anyway. So I, I we have uh, social the social media. We post um, new articles three times a week through the blog, uh, as well as uh, we have a podcast that goes up on Friday, and then the video version of the podcast goes up on Sunday. This last week, we had Dr. Matt McLean from uh, Masters University talking about statistical barominology. So if you like being a nerd, you'll like hanging out with me because uh, <laughs> that's basically what I do is nerd stuff. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I've got. And I'm sure that Sal will link to us uh, in the uh, video description. So Yes, it's, it's a real privilege uh, knowing a fellow graduate student, a fellow student of science. And one reason this is really important is the creationists have gotten such a really bad reputation, perhaps some of it's deserved, uh, but a lot of it's not, that we're anti-science. 
so it's really uh, quite a treasure to see people who are creationists also succeeding in graduate school studies of biology. So with that said, the topic of today is non-DNA inheritance. And to introduce the topic, I'm just gonna go right to a Wikipedia article on structural inheritance. Let me see. Don't cite Wikipedia, by the way. <laughs> For anybody, any students out there watching this, never cite Wikipedia. Your teachers will hang you. Um, <laughs> But it is a good it is a good place to get an overview and give you a, a, a pointer as to where you can go look for more information. Yes, yes, and, and that's just you know, <clears throat> I'm only doing this to, just to introduce the topic because it seems so radical. But we are going to go and visit some peer reviewed literature, so I'm just going to read this and. We'll just go through the uh, th through the Wikipedia article. Structural structural inheritance or cortical inheritance is the transmission of an epigenetic trait in a living organism by a, by a self perpetuating spatial structures. This is in contrast to the transmission of digital information, such as is found in DNA sequences, which account for the vast majority of known genetic variation. I should mention the word epigenetic in that uh, first paragraph. That's such an abused term. I don't. I personally try to avoid using it because everyone has their definition of what epigenetic means. Examples of structural inheritance include the propagation of prions, the infectious proteins of diseases such as uh, scrappy in sheep and goats, bovine spongiform encephalopathy mad cow disease, and uh, Kreutzfeldt-Jacob disease, although the protein-only hypothesis of prion transmission has been con considered contentious until recently. Prions based on heritable protein structure also exist in yeast. Structural inheritance also has been seen in the orientation of cilia in protozoans such as paramecium and tetrahymena, and handedness of the of the spiral in in the cell in tetrahymena and shells of snails some organelles also have structural inheritance such as the centriole and the cell itself defined by the plasma membrane may also be an example of structural inheritance to emphasize the difference of the molecular mechanism of structural inheritance from the canonical Watson Crick based pairing mechanism of, trans, of transmission of genetic information, the, the term epigenetic templating was introduced. And oh my goodness, they have to use that word epigenetic. Oh. <laughs> That's just a pet peeve of mine uh, because epigenetic could refer to so many things. And if we talk about chromatin modifications, people know what you're talking about. If you talk about cortical inheritance, they know what you're talking about. So uh, epigenetic is just like too, too broad a term. That's just my opinion. So there over here in the diagram is pictured a centriole. And unfortunately, even though I studied this in cell biology, I didn't study it hard enough. And it's, it's worth investigating. So they used the term prion, and we can look at that. So, Emery, do you have some thoughts? Not at this point, no. Um, I'm, you know, just taking it in. Uh, epigenetics is not something I am massively well versed in. I do have a little bit, like I've done a little bit of writing on the topic, but not a lot. So, I'm kind of just okay. picking it up as we go along. So, well, you see, um, everyone in biology, there's so many specialties. Like I really don't know organismal biology very well at all. Like it, it, some people just know all, all these various kinds of species and their habitats. I have no clue about that. And so when I hear all these talk about uh, the fossil record and all the various organisms and supposedly what their descendants are, I have I'm totally disconnected from that. So you, people can probably guess my specialty tends toward the cellular and molecular level. So let's look at what a prion is. 
Prions are misfolded proteins with the ability to transmit their misfolded shape onto normal variants of the same protein. They characterize several fatal and transmissible neurodegenerative diseases in humans and many other animals. It is not known what causes the normal protein to misfold, but the abnormal three-dimensional structure is suspected of conferring infectious properties, collapsing nearby protein molecules into the same shape. The word prion derives from proteinaceous infectious particle. The hypothesized role of a protein as an infectious agent stands in contrast to all other known infection infectious agents, such as viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites, all of which contain nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, or both. So I need to add just a little bit of a thought here is if protein folding is so important in that something that's outside of DNA can fold the protein correctly and it's really important, where did that original fold come from? Because once it's broken, we so, can see. You know you're not allowed to ask those questions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So I'm just throwing that in there just to uh, stir the pot a little bit. Now, the interesting thing is we have these other things that can be inherited. And they said that cell itself may also be an example of structural inheritance, the whole thing. And let me see. Uh, that's about all of the Wikipedia article. And we can explore, uh, we'll explore something a little more. More technical. Yes, yes. All right, so this is from extendedevolutionarysynthesis.com. Do you know anything about this extended evolutionary synthesis? A little bit. These are folks who are recognizing that there are problems with mainstream evolutionary dogma and they want to fix the problems and so they're they've, they've gotten into the extended evolutionary synthesis i don't know a whole whole lot more than that though okay so i'm just going to go to their main website what is the extended of the extended evolutionary synth synthesis is a new is a new way to think about and understand evolutionary phenomenon that differs from the conception that has dominated evolutionary thinking since the 1930s i.e. the modern synthesis. Uh, the EES does not replace traditional thinking, but rather can be deployed alongside it to stimulate research in evolutionary biology. Um, like the EES, the modern synthesis also represents a particular way to understand evolution. Its primary it primarily focuses on genes. New variations arise through random genetic mutation. Inheritance occurs through DNA. Natural selection of genes is the sole cause of, of adaptation. The field of evolutionary ha biology has evolved, incorporating many new theoretical and empirical findings, neutral theory, inclusive fitness theory. As a result, well, that's the first time I heard of inclusive fitness. <laughs> I actually know what that is. Um, oh. <laughs> Is it so, another garbage term or is it a real thing? It's another garbage term. Okay. It, it's, it's an extension of their, th their thinking when it comes to sexual selection and normal evolutionary fitness. Uh, essentially what inclusive fitness is, is it's, it's fitness not just of the organism itself, but of its genetic relatives. So in other words, it, it, it's, to, to, it's, tr it's a way to explain um altruism that's what they're trying to do with with inclusive fitness if i'm recalling correctly now it's been a little bit since i've toyed around with this but if i'm recalling correctly what they're doing is inclusive fitness basically says okay we're not we can't just measure the fitness of organism x we have to measure the fitness of organism x plus the the all it's all the genes that are in its relatives so that might explain why it acts in an altruistic behavior because even if it doesn't pass on its genes maybe a genetic relative will pass on its genes. I think that's a pretty close approximation. And if I'm, if I'm incorrect, then I will get shredded in the, in the chat. But, uh, if, I, but if I'm incorrect, please point out where I was incorrect. Cause if I remember correctly, that's what it is. And 
and, and to the viewers, if you hear Emery and I just trashing evolutionary theory, my, at least for me, my major complaint is it doesn't square with our understanding of chemistry, physics, physiology, and cell biology. It's, it's that simple. These are just, I'll, I'll ask very basic questions and I'll say, how can random mutation and natural selection build that? And I get the same non-answers based on these worthless phylogenetic reconstructions, which are not explanation, which aren't mechanistic explanations. They're just circular reasoning posing as real science. So anyway. Well, phylogenetic reconstructions are utterly, utter bunk. They're, yeah. they're, it, unless, uh, the only way they're not is if they're among related organisms. Organisms yeah. that we actually are related, not evolutionarily related, like actually are related. Within created kinds, they might maybe be useful, but beyond that, they're, they're bunk, absolute bunk. And, and so I invite the readers, I'm gonna try to get contact Change Tan, but Dr. James Carter and I will be talking about eukaryotic evolution, and we will actually show why these phylogenetic reconstructions were worthless. Because you can assume common ancestry, and you could say that this is the evolutionary line, but it still doesn't explain why the creature's still alive. And even, and what I mean by that, even Michael Behe accepts universal common ancestry. Perhaps nominally, he's not that committed to it. But he said, even with the, accepting that as an axiom, uh, one can't run away from the, the marvelous coordinated transformations that have to happen for universal common ancestry to move forward. So evolutionary biologists, though they don't want to admit it, are in the position of needing miracles to keep their theory working. And they'll, they'll deny it. Um, they'll totally deny it uh, fervently, but then they have no, they can't reconcile it with basic concepts of chemistry and statistics and physics. It ends up being requiring statistical miracles. Uh, God willing, Dr. Carter and I will talk about that this coming Sunday. So anyway, I, I'm not going to belabor this. It's just going to go nowhere. So let's go back to, there it is. Structural inheritance. Okay, so this is from an evolutionary, uh, these are from evolutionary biologists, not that I totally agree with them, but I just want to, I'm citing them because I want to show how important, how much inheritance is taught in a textbook as being like the DNA, you know, they'll say the DNA is the blueprint for all of us. That's not true. That is not true. And this is, credit these evolutionary biologists, they're picking up on this. So they say structural inheritance, the parent as a developmental template. Structural inheritance, hang on, let me make this bigger. Structural inheritance is an often neglected form of non-genetic inheritance. In their new book, Extended Heredity, A New Understanding of Inheritance and Evolution, authors Russell Bondurianski and Troy Day describe numerous examples of structural inheritance where structural features and their mutilations are inherited in subsequent generations through self-templating and related processes. Parental traits scaffold offspring development in many ways and at different levels. For example, at the whole organism level, parental traits provide an ambient environment and in some animals also a cultural context for development. Scaffolding also occurs at the cellular and molecular level. Though inheritance of epigenetic and cyto through and through inheritance of epigenetic and cytoplasmic factors and the template-like process of cell division that shape daughter cells, daughter cell features. This scaffolding is inescapable because all cells come from pre-existing cells all the way back to the origin of life. And cell components cannot spontaneously assemble themselves to form a new cell. For some cell features that are more or less directly shaped by pre-existing features, we can go beyond a general scaffold for development and talk about structural inheritance. Uh, kudos for them for saying cell components cannot spontaneously assemble themselves to form a new cell. Um, I wonder if they thought through the implications of that statement. 
Uh, no, they're evolutionary biologists, so you can forget about systematic thinking. I know that's a me thing to say. Uh, there are numerous fascinating examples of structural inheritance occurring in protists, single-celled eukaryotes. From the mid-1990s, researchers have been manually disrupting, manually disrupting structural elements of these tiny yet complex organisms with extremely interesting results. The protist Diflugia corona has a ring of teeth around its circular mouth. When some teeth are knocked out using a fine glass needle, daughter cells inherit the altered number and shape of teeth for many generations, producing new lines with these new teeth patterns. Hmm. Another example is the pattern of cilia on Paramecium aurelia. This protease can re reproduce sexually via conjugation where two individuals join temporarily to exchange genetic material. When part of one individual is removed, the other incorporates the remainder of its partner into itself, which changes the pattern of cilia on its surface. This altered pattern can be passed on for hundreds of generations and influences the swimming pattern of the descendant cells. Interesting, very interesting. Um, that's the first time I've heard of, a, of hundreds of generations. I've heard of a couple of generations, but I never I have not heard about of hundreds of generations before. Interesting. And you know, like a lot of things, people would say, uh, they, you know, these are isolated cases. It's like, well, maybe that's the tip of the iceberg. If one were really willing to probe more, one would see that there is a lot of structural inheritance. And uh, so this is just hoping to be, you know, right now we're touching the tip of the iceberg. Trypanosoma brucei is the protozoan parasite that causes sleeping sickness in humans. Each cell has a single attached flagellum that runs the length of the cell in a helical pattern. As the new flagellum grows along the daughter cell during cell division, it remains tethered to the parental flagellum, which directs and maintains its path along the daughter cell. This in turn arranges intracellular components and determines cell polarity. The wall of the diatom cyclotella mene Niana, I'm sorry to- I don't know either, Sal. I'm, I'm just butchering that. Provides yet another example of parental templating. These cells have specialized cell wall structure called salacious valves, one at each pole. During cell division, each daughter cell receives one parental valve from which a new valve is formed, faithfully replicating parental valve structure. And that was one of the creatures. The mechanisms of structural inheritance go beyond simple templated copying. Take hy hypotrich ciliates, for example. When they are starved, they become cysts, dormant, round, apparently featureless balls. When conditions improve, they emerge from the cysts and take on their previous active form. If the ciliates are experimentally manipulated before encystment, they emerge from the cyst, regenerating some elements of the manipulated form. The examples above suggest that structural inheritance is pervasive over eukaryotic lineages and that the cortex, that is the surface membrane and underlying proteins and cytoskeleton of the parent, parent cell shape features of the daughter cell. These and other examples demonstrate striking changes in phenotype without change to genetic sequence. With the phenotypes, sometimes inherited over many, many generations. Some important questions arise. What about structural inheritance in multi-celled eukaryotes? Is it involved in inheritance of non-cortical structures? And what are the evolutionary consequence, consequences of structural inheritance? Processes similar to those in single cell eukaryote cell division probably occur in cell lineages during development of multi-celled organisms. But we don't know, but we don't yet know if structural variations persist across generations in multicelled eukaryotes and if they play a role in heredity. There are, however, some suggestions that this might be the case. The structure of the egg cell, both the cortex and the intracellular components, 
is important for proper embryo development. When the egg cell contents are mixed up, embryos develop abnormally, like duh, um, sorry. As the egg is made by the mother, it can reflect influences of both the maternal genome and environment. And it's possible that some of these influences can be passed on to the next generation via egg structure. Other potential instances of structural inheritance in multicelled eukaryotes may be, may be found in lipid membranes and prion-like proteins. Cellular membranes are always formed from pre-existing membranes, though the insertion of proteins and uh, through the insertion of proteins and lipids. Membrane heredity may allow the inheritance of membrane polarity, topology, and composition from previous generations. Prions are proteins that direct certain normal proteins to fold abnormally, leading to neurodegenerative diseases such as mad cow disease. Uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. By passing on their abnormal protein folding, prions replicate and disease progresses. It's possible there are many normal cytoplas cytoplasmic proteins with prion-like properties capable of altering three-dimensional shape of other proteins. These may be responsive to, environment, uh, to the environment and inherited through germline biogamete cytoplasm. There's still a lot of work to be done to fully appreciate the generality and, import and importance of structural inheritance and evolution. We know that it appears to be pervasive across single-celled eukaryotes, but it is still unclear whether it occurs transgenerationally in multicellular, multicelled organisms. If it does, understanding the evolutionary consequences of this form of extra genetic inheritance will become an exciting research direction. So I'm just going to take a pause here and um, I mean, I think epigenetics or the cortical uh, inheritance is, is really, really cool and interesting. Um, um, but uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's an aberration, but I also am hesitant to get too excited about it yet. I want some more data and I want to see it, I want to see it in, inherited longer in organisms that are not single celled before I get too, too excited about it. Um, I'm kind of in the same position, but it's one of those things that's like, would I be rather on the creationist side or the evolutionary side in light of this? Because you know, it can, uh, let's say it just stops there. Well, evolutionary theory already has so many of its problems, but let's say the field advances. It can't be good for the evolutionary biologist. No, the, the, there is, there's, no, there's no good way this ends for the evolutionary biologist. Yeah. It, like, it just doesn't, there's no, there's no good way this ends. Yes, yes, we, we're, uh, we're definitely kind of seeing it the same way. And I'm gonna uh, go back to that I want to point out something with the I'm going to share the screen again. This again was from the uh, Wikipedia article and it's showing the centriole, an organelle involved in cell division and it's structurally inherited. So what that has to do with the next um, peer reviewed well, this is actually, now we're actually getting into a real peer-reviewed paper. I'm not going to go through all of it. Um, this is December 20th, 2000, 2017. So remember that the structure of the centriole is inherited. And here it is, uh, the unstructural diverse, the ultra-structural, the ultra-structural diversity between, between centrioles of eukaryotes. And you can kind of guess where I'm going with this. So I'm going to um, maybe just read the abstract in a few paragraphs because this is a very long involved article. Several decades of centriole research have revealed the beautiful symmetry present in these micro microtubule based organelles, which are required to form centrosomes, cilia and flagella in many eukaryotes. Centriole architecture is largely conserved across most organisms. 
However, individual centriolar features such as the cent central cartwheel or micro microtubule walls exhibit considerable variability when examined with finer resolution. In this paper, we review the ultrastructural characteristics of cent centrioles in commonly studied organisms, highlighting the subtle and not so subtle differences between specific structural components of these centrioles. In addition, we survey some non-canonical centriole structures that have been discovered in various species from the coaxial bi bicentrioles, the protists, and lower land plants to the giant irregular centrioles of the fungus gnat ciata. Finally, we speculate on the functional significance of these differences between centrioles and the contribution of individual structural elements such as the cartwheel or microtubules toward the stability of centrioles. Now, the reason I highlighted this is I'm getting the sense as I read through this paper that the eukaryotes have, it may be conserved, but there's also parts that are not. How did those arise if the structure is inherited? That's a good question. And maybe I'll just read some of the opening paragraphs and maybe get to the conclusion. We'll move on to the next paper. Centrioles, centrioles are some of the most evolutionary conserved organelles that also exhibit inherent rotational symmetry, easily recognizable by the regular arrangement of microtubule, microtubules around a central cartwheel. Centrioles serve as, a, as the structural basis for the formation of centrosomes, cilia, and flagella. And I really need to go brush up on centrosomes. The discovery of centrioles is attributed to Theodore Boveri, who identified them as dense granules in the center of centrosomes in 1888. For most of the 20th century, centrioles were primary, primarily recognized uh, focal points of spindle poles. This definition of centriole remained unchanged until the mid-1950s when Etienne uh, de Harven and Wilhelm Bernhard first characterized the symmetric arrangements of centriolar microtubules by using newly developed methods for electron microscopy. During the decades that followed, researchers in the field have enthousi enthusiastically characterized the ultrastructure of centrioles from a wide range of eukaryotes, providing us with an extensive amount of literature on the conserved and yet somehow diverse structures of these extraordinary organelles. Why study st centriole structure at all? In the last few years, tremendous advances have been made toward elucidating the molecular architecture and assembly uh, pathways of centrioles. Um, they, they're pointing out the different patterns here. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to skip it in the interest of time, but you could see like, the C. elegans, the worm here. Let's see if I can highlight it with my. The distal view. And you compare that with the distal view of another creature, uh, Drosophila. And you compare the Drosophila with humans. See if they have a distal view. They don't have a distal view. Well, just the, the distal view change between Drosophila and C. elegans is, is massive. Yes, yes. So the point is, it's like, okay, so that looks like a macroevolutionary change to me, and it's not genetic. So we don't call it mutations. What do they call it? Mutilations? I mean... I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah, I don't know what they do with that. I don't know what you do with that as an evolutionist. I really don't. Yeah, yeah. What are you gonna? You know, I, I'm just like, um, as I said, I'm, I, I'm with you. This is not as well developed as I'd like it to be, but it can't end well. The way this is moving, because I, I looked, this is maybe five years ago when I looked into this, and more papers have finally started to come out. So. This is just the cent this is just the centriole and uh, th they're talking about the polarity 
Let me see. The proximal. Let me just compare something. I'm trying to see. I think they even said you'll see different rotations. Um, and I'm just going to leave it to the readers to, to look that up. Um, but we're going to move on. And I'm just going to, you know, what I probably will try to do is just put this at least in the description also for my own uh, future reference. So we'll move on to another. Let me just stop my share while I look for the next paper. And if you have some thoughts while I... Uh, I, I just... I find that I don't see any kind of like uh, kind of like Sal said. I don't see any possible way that this 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 goes well for them because if it stays where it is right now, they have to explain non-genetic inheritance in a in a dogma that is built entirely on genetic inheritance. But if it goes further and there starts being even more development of non-genetic inheritance, then all of a sudden their nice little everything's inherited dogma kind of goes out the window. Now, I could see them kind of slipping back into Lamarckism slightly on this, but I don't really see how else they could possibly handle it. And, and where it is significant is if the change is actually really critical to its to its functionality and it's deeply integrated. It's like, how do you account for that? So um, uh, I'll just keep moving forward. I, ha I found the other paper. This was actually a pretty, this is a groundbreaking paper by uh, Warren and Wickner. And for a while, this was the only paper I had. <laughs> so even five years ago, there was not that many and this was like the main one but since then it's become more interesting. So the title of this paper, Organelle Inheritance, and this is a review, February 9th, 1996 in Cell Press. And I'll just read the abstract here. Every membrane bordered organelle in a particular cell type has a characteristic copy number, size and position, which reflects its cellular function. Mitochondria, for example, are located, are often located near organelles that, let me just uh, make this bigger. Mitochondria, for example, are often located near organelles that consume energy and their number is determined by the magnitude, magnitude of these energy needs. They are abundant in muscle cells with, where they are interwoven with the myofibrils that generate mechanical force. In sperm cells, they are tightly wrapped around the flagellum, providing the energy needed for movement. In ion transporting epithelial cells, they are integrated, interdigitated, interdigitated, that's a new word, with extensive, extensive infoldings of the plasma membrane across which a high flux of ions is pumped. Last, they are packed together in longitudinal arrays in the inner segments of retinal rods and cones where they provide energy for the phototransduction process. Whoa, that never occurred to me. The, the mitochondria are just, I'm sorry. Did I hear that correctly? <laughs> uh, like you have to position the mitochondria in the cell, have the right density and location. <laughs> okay, well, let's just explain that. Yeah, take that. <laughs> this, is, this is stuff you don't get in the textbook. This is why this is fun. Because if you, you know. True. Yeah, this is just, I, I thought that was maybe, that, that, that made my day right there. During the cell cycle, each organelle must double in size, divide, and be delivered to its proper location in the daughter cells. Um, I just want to point this out because I had an argument with Jackson Wheat sometime ago about membrane-bound organelles. I'm just like, dude, this is not trivial that you have organelles that can basically divide, you know, and multiply. And like, you know, you say, oh, there's just leaky membranes. and like, that's not going to solve these other problems. Anyway, 
This problem has fascinated cell biologists since the turn of the century, when specific cytochemical markers made it possible to follow individual organelles by microscopy. Wilson, 1925. Interest waned uh, because uh, the structure of membranes was unknown and their biogenesis could not be studied. It is now time to revive this interest because systems exist to solve these problems. The accompanying review by Nunari and Walter addresses the issue of organelle biogenesis. We review here what is known about organelle inheritance and describe those systems that are yielding insights into this process at the molecular level. Again, this is a 1996 paper and much has happened, but this is kind of a nice introduction. I, this is one of my favorite papers on the topic. Why inherit organelles? The accuracy of the inheritance process strongly suggests that all organelles use partitioning mechanisms. In many instances, the need is obvious. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA, which encodes proteins and tRNAs essential for their function. The need to inherit endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum, ER, is equally obvious. Membranes cannot be synthesized de novo. Um, membranes cannot be synthesized de novo. And, and all membranes that are linked by vesicle-mediated transport, including the Golgi apparatus, the plasma mem membrane, endosomes, lysosomes, and secretory granules originate in large part from proteins and lipids that are synthesized in the ER. Inheritance of at least a portion of the ER is therefore essential. Inheritance of the plasma membrane is the inevitable consequence of the need to provide a boundary for the daughter cells. Um, yeah, it's like, well, how can a cell uh, exist without a pre-existing plasma membrane to begin with? There, there's all kinds of problems there. I mean, membranes can't be synthesized de novo, which, which we do. Uh, I mean, which they, they have to have in order for evolution to be true. I mean, you can just go through the laundry list of stuff that is there that's incorrect or that, that challenges their own dogma. Yeah. Uh, again, where I'm focused on, it's just interesting in its own right that there is much, just the, just pausing a little bit, I'm just going to pause a little bit and point this out. Um, I've asked uh, some of my engineering friends, people in the computer industry, I said, okay, so if the, if the human genome is 90% junk, like what Dan Grauer and, evolu and many evolutionary biologists assert, that means... The com something as complex as a human being was encoded by 80 megabytes. Do you believe that? And a lot of engineers would say no way when they see the complexity of all the organs and systems, like say even just the, the eyes and the ears and sensory organs, not to mention everything else. It's like, you're kidding me, 80 megabytes. And we go even up to three gigabytes. And that even, you know, just kind of intuitively, that just seems like not quite enough. And so that was my interest in this, is what other mechanisms are there that enable the encoding of, inf of, of organizational information? And it seems that templating it is a really smart way to do it, um, where the organelle just serves as a template for the next organelle. I mean, that just seems really intuitively obvious. And, yeah, uh, I mean, it makes sense to me if you're going to design something where it needed to replicate itself, just rather than have a bunch of templates that never get used, just use the existing thing as the template. Yeah. So so just independent of the creation evolution thing, this is this really sparked my curiosity. I said, now the accounting looks a little better if we consider this sort of structural inheritance or cortical inheritance. The need to inherit those membranes that arise from the ER is much less clear. As an example, the integral membrane proteins and lipids of the Golgi apparatus are derived entirely from the ER. If a daughter did not inherit a copy of the Golgi apparatus, it should be able to synthesize one de novo. Several experiments suggest that this is possible, but slow, which might explain the evolution of an inheritance mechanism. The time taken to grow a new Golgi apparatus de novo would put an organism, especially a unicellular organism, at strong selected disadvantage in a competitive environment. 
uh, just as a reference point, they found that their uh, surprise, uh, really no surprise, but surprise, surprise, that there are many backup mechanisms. So sometimes uh, there, we don't know exactly how it's able to reconstitute an organelle if it doesn't have a template. Some of the organelles, Golgi is one of them. But then it's the standard regular mechanism appears to make Golgi apparatus from a pre-existing one. But they've done experiments where they're able to grow one very slowly uh, where they didn't have the Golgi apparatus. Uh, that's actually a very interesting evolutionary problem. How did backup systems evolve? Because um, a backup system would often be the first thing to be tossed, just like a spare tire. So, right. Right. If you if the cell's um, trying to, and this is a thing too that happens in nature, the cell is constantly trying to streamline, trying to get rid of stuff it doesn't need. So why even keep a backup system? Exactly. Exactly. And um, yeah, that's a whole nother topic of devolution and genetic entropy, but uh, that there's a lot of experimental evidence to that effect, not just theoretical, it's backed up. Anyway, partitioning strategies. Studies on the inheritance of chloroplasts and mitochondria in the early part of this century lay the foundations for the study of organelle inheritance. Of particular note are the pioneering studies on mitochondrial inheritance by E.B. Wilson, 1925. These studies which identify the different inheritance strategies were later placed on, more, on a more quantitative footing by Berkey, 1983. Perhaps the most important early discovery was the observation that the inheritance strategy adopted by a particular organelle varied from cell type to cell type and from organism to organism. <laughs> Let me read that again. Probably the most important early discovery was the observation that the inheritance strategy adopted by a particular organelle varied from cell type to cell type and from organism to organism. Oh my, I totally missed that on the first reading. Even within a particular cell type, different organelles could use different strategies. The inheritance of cellular organelles therefore differs fundamentally from the inheritance of chromosomes where a single universal strategy is used based on the mitotic spindle. Whoa, I'm just saying this is just totally cool. So essentially what they're saying is uh, the way that organisms inherit their mitochondria, their various other cellular organelles varies basically by species. And cell types within the species. Oh my goodness. That's nuts. That is nuts. And you know what? why that doesn't totally surprise me? That earlier paragraph when it was describing how the mitochondria are, are associated with different parts of the cell, mm -hmm. depending on the cell type, I said this, it wouldn't surprise me if that's why they're different strategies. I mean, this is just like, a, you know, when I first read this, I was just glossing it over because I was looking for the structural inheritance stuff. But this is before I took cellular biology. And now this is just exploding in my head the complexity and the care and the mastery. This is, um, yeah, I should back up a little bit. Jesus said, consider the lilies of the valley and how they grow. And like, oh my goodness, that's just one sentence and it describes all this. Mm -hmm. I, I think we might need to start considering the lilies a little bit more often. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, this is a really good paper. I, I, this has been like a set, this is like the foundational paper for like a lot of this. It, it, it kind of reinvigorated the whole field. The, um, there are two inheritance strategies used by organelles. The first is stochastic and relies on an organelle being present in multiple copies during the division process, more or less randomly dispersed throughout the mitotic cell cytoplasm. Nearly equal partitioning then relies on a cytokinetic mechanism that must divide the cell into two equally sized daughters and on the number of copies of the organelle that are present. The more copies there are, the greater the accuracy. The advantage of such a probabilistic strategy is that it does not require any mechanical link between the mechanism that divides the mother cell and the dividing organelle. Any organelle that is present in multiple dispersed copies during division will be inherited more or less equally by each daughter cell. 
There are multiple randomly dispersed copies of mitochondria throughout the cell in many cell types. So they only need a mechanism to ensure a doubling in mass and the maintenance of copy number to ensure equal inheritance. In contrast, in um, Euglena gracilis, the mitochondria exists as an extensive network in the cell periphery during interphase. Inheritance by a stochastic process is ensured by the fragmentation of this network at the onset of mitosis and the randomization of the fragments. After cell division, the network is rebuilt in each daughter cell by a process involving the congregation of the fragments and fusion of the first outer and then inner mitochondrial membranes. So there has there the stochastic inheritance. Uh, and I'll read and then I'll go back to the figure. Um, I'll go, I, uh, I just wanna let the readers know. I'm gonna go back to the figures and we can look at it. I just wanna complete the thought. The second type of strategy, strategy used by organelles is an ordered strategy. This covers a number of disparate mechanisms, some of which use the mitotic spindle as a means of partitioning. Cytokinesis in animal cells is mediated by the contractile ring, which assembles just under the plasma membrane at a position equidistant from the mitotic spindle poles. Any organelle that runs from the pole, that runs from pole to pole straddling the equator would therefore be partitioned accurately. Perhaps the most extreme example studied by Wilson was spermatogenesis in the scorpion. Let's see if... Centris exicada, centris exicada. Individual mitochondria fused to form a ring that takes up tangential positions let, uh, I apologize. Let me make sure I'm getting this read correctly. It's all right. Scorpion. Okay. Maybe that is all right. I think I have it right. Centris ex ex exilicata. 1931. Individual mitochondria fused to form a ring that takes up a tangential position beside the spindle. It is drawn out by the elongating spindle to an ellipsoid form and breaks to form two half rings. Each is cut transversely during cleavage, yielding two equal fragments in each daughter cell. More recently discovered example, a more recently discovered example of ordered partitioning and one that does not appear to rely on the mitotic spindle is the inheritance of mitochondria in the budding yeast sacro Saccharomyces cerevisiae, some sort of yeast. The mitochondrion of this yeast forms a single filamentous network, which lies just under the plasma membrane. Almost as soon as a bud appears on the mother cell, the tip of this mitochondria network enters the bud. This is a very dynamic process with the mitochondria moving in and out during bud growth, a process that is only stopped by formation of the septum. These two strategies are not mutually exclusive and both can operate together, particularly when the copy number of the organelle is low. In two species of scorpion, and I can't pronounce it, Wilson found 24 mitochondria in the primary spermatocytes. After two mitotic, meiotic divisions, almost every cell had six plus or minus one mitochondria. This is much more accurate than would be predicted for a stochastic mechanism but not as good as an ordered one. Okay, so now I'll go to the diagrams. So there's stochastic inheritance there where they just make many copies of the organelles. And then when the cell splits, uh, they're pretty much equal numbers in the daughter cells. And then there's ordered inheritance. So I'll just read the caption. Stochastic inheritance in mammalian cells is seen for the ER and the attached nuclear envelope, the Golgi apparatus and the mitochondria. The accuracy of this mode of inheritance rests on large numbers of dispersed organelles and a cytokinetic mechanism for dividing the mother cell into two equally sized daughters. That's actually kind of 
we kind of take it for granted that it splits the mother into two equally sized daughters. Um, that may not be as trivial as we think. The number and distribution of the organelles during cell division either reflects their interface state, mitochondria, or the cell cycle, regulated conversion of single copy organelles, ER and Golgi, into multiple fragments. Ordered inheritance of organelles can also occur in the same cell, the best example being the plasma membrane. Ordered inheritance in S. cerevisiae is both spatially and cell uh, Space is both spatially and cell cycle regulated. It has been observed for the vacuole, mitochondrion, and ER, especially the nuclear envelope, and does not involve membrane fragmentation. The nucleus and vacuole are labeled N and B, and the peripheral filamentaceous structure is the mitochondria. Ooh, that was a load. Yeah. <laughs> this is okay. <laughs> Some of these papers could take a second look and probably a day of study. They threw a lot of terms. I'm ashamed I need to revisit them. So here there are, okay, so I'm presuming the N is the nuclear envelope, the nucleus, and we could see it splitting. And actually, this is kind of cool. You'll see that the, the two Vs here split first and then the nuclear envelope. That's nicely orchestrated. To coordinate all that, just, that's just remarkable. That is remarkable. So, so how did eukaryotes evolve again? Uh, they have a phylogenetic reconstruction that describes why <laughs> this will all be in place. I don't buy it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't buy that either. Okay, one last paper, and we'll finish up in an hour. Let me see if I... This is the coolest one. And obviously, I'm not going to read it all. The uh, in vitro formation of the endoplasmic endoplas reticulum occurs independently of microtubules by a controlled fusion reaction. Uh, I'm just going to read the abstract and then just highlight a few things. We have established an in, in vitro system, in vitro system for the formation of the endoplasmic endoplas reticulum, starting from small membrane vesicles prepared from Xenopus levis eggs, which I think are frogs, an elaborate network of membrane tubules is formed in the presence of, of cytosol. In the absence of cytosol, the vesicles only fuse to form large spheres. Network formation requires a ubiqu ubiquitous cytosolic protein and nucleoside triphosphates in, uh, is sensitive to n ethylmalamide and high cy cytosolic uh, calcium two plus ions uh, concentrations and proceeds by our intermediate stage, which vesicles appear to be clustered. Microtubules are not required for membrane tubule and network formation. Formation of the ER network shares significant similarities with formation of the nuclear envelope. Our results suggest that the ER network forms in a process in which cytosolic factors modify and regulate basic membrane reaction, um, basic reaction of membrane vesicle fusion. Now, that was a, a really packed abstract. And it's like, why did I find this? I was Googling around and trying to see how they uh, would actually create, like say either a Golgi apparatus or an endoplasmic reticulum. Let me see if I could find this. Let me search the word rat. All right. So what they did, they found out something interesting. If you don't begin with a organelle, you don't get an organelle. You could put all the stuff in there, but if you don't seed it with a piece of the organelle, it's not going to. So you could have the DNA code all the proteins you need. You can throw all the lipids or whatever else. But if you don't have a beginning structure, let me see if they use the word seed. Okay, anyway, where did they have the word rat? OK, 
Okay, so they, they're preparing the various membranes and cytosols. So they use the dog pancreas, rough ER microsomes, yeast membranes and cytosol, wheat germ cytosol. Uh, they took, uh, oh yeah, the cytosol membranes from rat or cow, liver or cow pancreas or percent were prepared essentially as described. It's, it's right here, I'm sorry, preparation. So they threw all of this in and I'm just gonna summarize it. When they didn't have like a starting membrane, they could have all this, but it wouldn't form the organelle. Once you had a piece of the organelle there, it was able to grow it. Uh, that's kind of where the stage of research is at this time. So that's, that's really all I had. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I, I wouldn't, uh, I'm not necessarily, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully skeptical. I think that's probably the best way to describe me about uh, this, the way, way we're thinking here. But uh, I think that there's some interesting stuff here. And I think it'd be, um, I think it'd be very interesting to, to see what, you know, goes, what, how it goes from here, because I'm going to be very, uh, I'm going to be monitoring this because I'd like to, I, I, again, I think this is a win-win for creationists, no matter which way it goes. So, so this is just, um, maybe the takeaway is one, with all the terms that were thrown out in those papers, like the centrioles and the centrosomes and um, the microtubules and the phases of the cell, I'm just like, yeah, I did take cell biology, but now I, I really need to spool up. So for, for nothing else, um, that, that was saying, this is still good stuff to learn and the second thing is, uh, I, I wanted to get away, I just wanted to point out that um, DNA is not the only inheritance out there. There's, uh, the interest of mine was, do, you, do we really think 3.3 gigabases is enough to code something as complex as a human being? Uh, and remember, like 90% of that's junk. <laughs> So I, Sarcasm, I just, by the way, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was just saying, I, I think that there's probably a lot of organizational information in the recipe of making a human being that is not stored in the DNA. I, I'm, I'm more convinced of that. And we're just going to see where it goes. So um, I just thought that'd be kind of a, uh, a just a, a detour into something interesting that could really explode many, many decades from now. I don't think we have the c capacity to really grasp what's there. Dr. Tan said, well, you know, we always keep talking about DNA because that's the easiest thing to recapitulate in the cell. You can get the DNA sequence and rebuild it. You can't rebuild cy cytosols from scratch in their state. And the state of the cytosol is really important. And, um, and so there's a lot of information there, organizational in terms of the recipe of how to make a cell that we just really don't comprehend. And it has so many levels of redundancy uh, that it's, you know, DNA has a lot of single knockout. If you knock this out, then the, the gene dies or whatever. Uh, the cytosol probably has so many backup copies. Uh, you can't really do easy knockout experiments. Uh, just like with that experiment where they had the, the little seed of the organelle. A any piece of the organelle could hypothetically serve as a template for the, the rest of the organelle. You just need a little piece. So you can't really, you have to knock out the entire organelle and all the, basically all the potential templates to really see the, uh, the how structural inheritance works. It's very hard, hard to identify where the template actually resides uh, because there's the redundancy resides so deeply within the cell, which is a good thing. Um, I would also add, if that's the case, it's also really difficult to evolve because you have to evolve all the pieces all at once. And I, I just, you and know. Evolving all those pieces all at one time is, you, you need a, you need a, you need it, as Dr. David Menton says for Dr. For instance, Genesis says, by an incredible stroke of dumb luck. Yeah. And uh, you need more than one stroke. So, so if they're able to establish that the architecture of like, say, the Golgi, the endoplasmic reticulum, 
the, the structure of the nuclear envelope is different across eukaryotes. It's like, okay, how did you evolve all of them together simultaneously? If parts of that structure are, are not determined by genes, how did that evolve? Um, you basically have to evolve the whole thing all at once. And um, as you pointed out, we're not quite there where we can make those statements unequivocally, but um, there, there's nowhere for the evolutionists to go, but downhill, you know? Yeah, it's, it's going straight downhill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, th this is not a fight. They already have enough fights on their hands. So um, I'll, I'll give you the last word and uh, uh, thanks for joining me on this talk. I, I really did want to put this out there even if it might just float over the heads of most people and they may not show interest, I still felt a responsibility to talk about it and get away from DNA centrism. Oh, no, that, that's, that's fine. Glad to, glad to chat. Um, I, I'll be perfectly honest. I think you're probably a little bit more hopeful about this than I am. Um, but at the same time, I'm, as I said, I'm hopefully optimistic that the, uh, this cortical inheritance or, uh, uh, non DNA inheritance, I guess would be the way that probably the best described it for the layman. Um, is something that is worth watching and something to to keep an eye on. Um, I know that there's already a uh, there's been some work with creationists trying to incorporate non DNA inheritance. Um, I'm not necessarily on board with that, um, and you can find out why if you go over to my channel and I've got stuff on on that stuff. But um, but I, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'd like I'd like to see this work out. I just don't know that we've got quite enough data yet. So. Yeah, I mean, but it's been always good talking to you, Sal, and uh, always good, uh, you know, nerding out about sciencey stuff. So, yeah, all good by me. Well, um, if you have a paper you'd like to to uh, talk with me about, um, more in your field and outside of mine, uh, I'm open I may to be sending you some papers on sexual selection. I'm working through them right now. Okay, okay. Um, so um, maybe a, a week before your semester starts, we could look into some of these papers so maybe next week we could meet and yeah i'll cover yeah, one of your papers because I, I think the last at least the last two times it was one of my papers and topics hey, that's fine so you, you this is your channel you're you you set the tone i just uh i show up and i try to sound like i'm intelligent it's hard work sometimes given some of the stuff you want to talk about but i try <laughs> all righty well i'd like to thank uh all the viewers who joined us today and suffered through some of this reading i think um, one reason I've, I've done this is I want to set an example for what it takes sometimes to appreciate the work of God. Um, it's usually not handed to us on a silver platter. It's there. I, and this year in particular, I've been reading a lot about uh, I'll declare the works of the Lord. And sometimes declaring the works of the Lord can be tedious because it's very involved. And sometimes we don't have, we have to actually learn a lot to be able to appreciate what's actually there. This is somewhat analogous to the situation where a caveman runs into a computer chip. To him, it just looks like an ordinary pebble. But it, to a 20th century or 21st century man, that computer chip is very different from a pebble. And that's kind of the situation here. We may look at biology and not, you know, we might trivialize it. And evolutionary biologists have tried to trivialize it and say it's junk and it's not sophisticated. I always find it kind of curious that people like Dan Grauer, it seems their mission in life is to prove that 90% of their DNA is junk. And uh, yeah, that's I mean, their purpose in life. You know, it's like, what would they live for if they didn't have that? Um, but then as we actually look at the wonders of the cell, we see, we see, as it says in Romans, uh, God's invisible attributes, um, so many things about him, his divine nature are revealed in the, in the things that are made. And that's what we were seeing. So if, if you can just kind of step back a little bit and see the forest through the trees, you'll see that there's, there's a divine hand that built all this. It can't just have evolved. So um, I really want to thank the readers who've, who've, who've suffered through this. And uh, hopefully your soul will be better for having done this today. So Emery, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank my co-host Emery for joining me. It's nice to have some company when I read through this. It, uh, it's a lot less lonely. So thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you all next time. Take care and God bless you.